to those joining us virtually and to those here in headquarters in the BMA Auditorium, welcome to today's program. My name is Patrice Dobache. I'm the Equal Employment Opportunity Specialist. I'm the EEO Training Program Coordinator. My pronouns are she, her. And I would describe myself as an African-American woman with short curly hair, wearing a black suit, and the best I can say is maybe a psychedelic black and white shirt. <laughs> Today's program is the result of months of ongoing collaboration between senior executives in the Office of Administration, the Office of Chief Human Capital Officer, the Office of Departmental EEO, the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and the Accessibility Review Committee. We are very excited for you to be here, to join us today, um, to be educated and inspired by all the amazing speakers that we have lined up today. So I'm not gonna take up your time, so let's get on with the program. I have the honor of introducing HUD's Chief Human Capital Officer, Lori Mikulski. Thanks, Patrice. I am so excited to welcome everyone to today's event, the importance of accessibility in building a winning culture. Accessibility is also part of what we're gonna be launching during our Disability Awareness Month, which kicks off this April. It is so exciting to see so many familiar faces and new faces both in the, in the room and virtually. Today we have the privilege of having Colonel, retired Colonel Gregory Gadsden as our keynote speaker. His life, his career is a embodiment of strength and resilience that is a true testament of the impact of embracing accessibility and inclusivity. For me, accessibility is a very personal story. My mom grew up, I grew up with my mom, and of course I grew up with my mom, but <laughs> my mom um, had multiple sclerosis. And so a large portion of my mom's life, her mobility depended on the use of a wheelchair. So I experienced firsthand the challenges that she faced with accessibility, both in public spaces, access to public facilities. Those challenges had an indelible impact on me. They helped me understand every barrier that she faced, helped me understand the importance of accessibility and why we need to make sure that everybody is aware of it. So during Disability Month, we're not only gonna be talking about disability, but we're gonna be launching several key initiatives that focus around accessibility. Not just physical infrastructure, but around making sure that every individual, regardless of their ability, has equal access to resources, opportunities and experiences. So this month, as we embrace Disability Awareness Month and we embrace, we embrace diversity, we foster and challenge equity, we foster inclusivity, I challenge everyone in this room to take inspiration from personal experiences like mine to help understand the impact that accessibility can have on millions of lives around the country. It's not about compliance. It's about independence. It's about belonging. And it's about dignity. The road ahead of us is filled with challenges, but it's also filled with immense opportunities. Opportunities to create awareness, to educate, to make sure that we're creating that inclusive culture and make sure everybody knows their role and their part in helping us create that culture. So while you listen to Colonel Gadsden's story today, I want you to be inspired by it. I want you to absorb some of the key insights that he is going to share on inclusion, on strength, on leadership, on building that winning culture. I know together we can impact the lives of millions of folks across the world in making sure that everyone feels valued, they feel respected, and they know that they can reach their full potential. So thank you for joining me on this journey today. I know together we can make sure that accessibility is not just a checkbox, that it truly is the cornerstone of our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and most importantly, accessibility. I cannot step off the stage without saying thank you to our partners at FEMA, who also helped us make this event possible, especially Director Gilliam, who played an important role in helping us make our connections. And so thank you for that partnership. 
It is now my extreme pleasure and honor to introduce to you someone who has been a champion of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility since he joined HUD. And this is his second tour at HUD, so since he rejoined HUD. My boss, my colleague, and my friend, General Deputy Assistant Secretary Kevin McNeely. Thank you, Lori. Um, also, thank you for making sure I wasn't the only one up here today without a tie on. So, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. I'm going to include accessibility in my comments, but I do want to go into the, the broader realm of accessibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, everything we do is about people, those on our team, and those we serve. Every day we have the opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. The key is that we have the opportunity. It's an opportunity we can choose to embrace or not. It's a decision each one of us makes every day, whether it's conscious or otherwise. When we don't embrace this opportunity, when we don't give our best, we not only let ourselves down, but our teammates, and more importantly, real people, families, and communities across our nation. No one of us can accomplish the department's mission. It's all about working together. It's all about the team. It's about learning from each other. It's about inspiring and empowering our teams and leveraging inclusion and diversity to strengthen our team and fill our own individual knowledge, skills, and experience gaps. It's achieving strength through unity. Together, we can accomplish great things. Not long ago, I was in Seattle for a, a meeting. It was a long day, and I was walking back to the hotel at the end. The time change was, was catching up with me, and I was really dragging and feeling my age. Darkness was creeping over the city, and a light rain had been coming down all day. I, I love dark, rainy days. I just, I know most people don't, but I really do. So it was, it was a good day, but I was, I was really worn out. I would call it cool, but most of you all would call it freezing, but I got a little bit of insulation to go along. It keeps me from getting cold. Um, but my body was reminding me of everything I'd done in my younger years. The dampness was creeping into my joints, and, and I was feeling every step on the way back to the the hotel. I stopped at a corner waiting for the light to turn, which is when everybody in Seattle knew I was a visitor because they didn't stop. They just went ahead and crossed. Um, anyway, while standing there on the corner, I noticed a young man curled up on the stairs of a building, lying in the entrance. He'd obviously been out in the rain all day and was soaking wet in cold weather. I've spent a lot of time soaking wet in cold weather. But I always knew at some point there was a warm shower, a hot meal, and a bed waiting for me. It may be a day out, it may be a week or two weeks out, or even longer, but I knew there was an end to it. I don't think this young man had that hope. He's the face of what happens when we don't seize the opportunity, when we don't leverage our team in its entirety to become better than any one of us. We've got a lot of work to do. We can't be complacent. We can't accept less than our best as an individual or as a team. Last week I was in San Francisco and found myself down, myself down in the very bottom of the subway about three hours after they told me to make sure I was out of the neighborhood. <laughs> a lot of people will say I, I don't listen very well. Part of it is because I don't hear very well, but my dad would say I've never listened very well. Anyway, I was deep in thought, and I, I heard a train coming, so I looked up to see if it was in my train, and as I looked out across the platform, I was kind of taken back. The, the platform was filled with people that didn't look like me. I think I was the only one in a white collar and a sport coat. And from the sound of conversations, I was probably the only one who wasn't bilingual. 
These were hardworking people that looked like they carried the weight of the world on their shoulders, fatigued, leaning on crutches, swaying on their feet, staring into the distance. From all appearances, many of them were finishing a second job, all of them getting ready to get on the BART for a long train ride to a neighborhood that doesn't have any jobs, but is the closest affordable housing for them. A lot ran through my mind, but foremost was how different my life is from theirs. Surrounding myself with people that share my experiences and my education, people that think like me, isn't gonna help me or the team understand the needs or better serve these hardworking people. Each of us has our own unique journey that's brought us here. By working together, by including others with different experiences, by embracing different ideas, perspectives, and leveraging our diversity, we can do great things to better serve these hardworking people. Good people that are simply striving to earn a living and support their families. In closing, it, it's not about us. It's about those we serve. It's about working together as a team. It's about embracing our differences, learning from each other, and including those with different thoughts and experiences. It's about making our country a better place for everyone. We've got a great guest speaker lined up. Lori already talked a little bit about Colonel Gadsden. For those of you that aren't familiar with him, buckle up. His journey is an amazing story of resilience and determination, and his thoughts on leadership are in insightful. So welcome, Greg, and thank you for joining us today. Colonel Gregory B. Gadsden. Colonel Gadsden a beacon of accessibility will share his deeply personal journey, a journey marked by years of dedicated service in the U.S. Army and a moment of profound sacrifice in Iraq where he lost both legs and the use of his right arm and hand in the line of duty. Yet, through unwavering perseverance, Colonel Gatson emerged not only as an advocate for wounded warriors and veterans, but as a celebrated figure in both film and television. Good afternoon, I'm Gerald Bennett, Chairman of the HUD Veterans Affinity Group, and I'm gonna welcome uh, Colonel Gra Gadsden to the stage. Colonel Gregory D. Gadsden, U.S. Army, retired, hails from Chesapeake, Virginia, and dedicated over 26 years of his service to the United States Army, culminating with a stint as the garrison commander at Fort Belvoir. There he oversaw the daily operations of, of operations of that post, which is a sustaining base, and had over 50,000 personnel and military uh, personnel and, and, and um, employees, which provided logistical, intelligence, medical, administrative support, and command and control to over 140 commands and agencies for the Department of Defense. A West Point graduate, Colonel Gadsden served in every major conflict over the past 20 years, including operations Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Joint Forge, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom, showcasing exceptional leadership and valor. But his life took a, a dramatic turn in 2007 when the IED attack resulted in the loss of both legs and significant use of his right arm. But undeterred, Colonel Gasson served, he continued to serve on active duty in the Army and became a motivational speaker, sharing his message of resilience, teamwork, and perseverance. Notably, Colonel Gadsden inspired the New York Giants to a victory in the 42nd Super Bowl, beating the then undefeated um, uh, New England Patriots. How can we forget them? But he gave a motivation to talk that turned the uh, turned it around for the New York Giants, who uh, started off that season pretty badly. But and after they you know, brought Colonel Gadsden, he uh, helped turn around, he helped turn things around with his motivation. And then he debuted in Battleship in 2012, 
as a war injured veteran who helped save the world from alien invasion. Today, he is an entrepreneur, veterans advocate, serves on several boards, including the Gary Sinise Foundation, and is an active participant in several sports, including cycling, skydiving, scuba diving, and skiing. Colonel Gasson's military honors include the Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, Bronze Stars, Purple Heart, and more. He is a graduate of the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and holds master's degrees in information systems from Webster University and policy management from Georgetown University. He also holds an honorary doctor of law, laws from Webster University. Now, if you will, please join me, stand and join me in welcoming one of Army football's most revered brothers, <laughs> Colonel Greg Gaston. Thank you, sir. thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Gerald, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction, and you all, thank you all very much for the welcome. I, um, I just cringe. I know I, I got to have a biography for the program, but it, uh, sometimes it feels like uh, someone's reading my obituary or something. So <laughs> maybe that's uh, so. Anyway, um, sir, ma'am, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to, to to be here as you all recognize um, D Disabilities uh, Awareness Month. Um, before I begin my remarks, uh, just uh, please uh, allow me to first and foremost acknowledge my faith in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I know without his grace, without his mercy, I, I, would, not, uh, I would not be before you all. And uh, again, Kevin and Lori, I appreciate you all setting the tone for, uh, for, for my remarks as, as we sort of challenge our organization. Um, I heard you talking about being our best and living up to our best. That's, that's what we own every single day, and I, I, I really try to live by that. I cannot live yesterday, and I cannot live tomorrow. I can only live today, and I can only be my best today. But I'd like to sort of approach uh, my remarks first, um, really from the very beginnings of our country, if you, if you will. You know, in the preamble of our Constitution, our forefathers, look, they, didn't, they knew we didn't have everything right. They didn't let perfect be the in, in, enemy of good enough when we started this nation. And we all know some of the challenges that uh, we've had to overcome, and we're still trying to overcome um, every single day. But in that preamble, I like to seize on this, this one phrase that says, in order to form a more perfect union. And so with that, that was the challenge that they gave every American in order to form a more perfect union. And that's about living up to our best selves, living up to the best that we can be every day. And, uh, and unlike any community that we have in our country, uh, I would say that the disability community, the disabled community, has been uniquely and consistently uh, across all communities been, uh, had, had the toughest way to go, Dis discriminated, if you will, challenged the most, regardless of, uh, regardless of communities. And so I would say that we have a, a lot of work to do. And so as we think about access, as leaders, as followers, it's really, about the, it's really about the dignity and, and respect that we consistently live by, that we consistently live by, not because uh, someone looks like me or doesn't look like me or we went to the, we had the same alma mater or we're from the same state, whatever we, whatever we draw our commonalities with, and, and I'm okay with that. We, we ought to be okay with finding what we're familiar with. But how do we live that? Do we, do we allow those biases to, to MP? Do we allow those biases that we have implicit, do we, do we allow those to prevent us from living up uh, to our best selves? 
Well, as a soldier in the Army, I, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution, but in a more personal level, I felt that those young men and women that raised their right hand to support and defend our Constitution, to support our way of life, I had the ultimate responsibility of making sure that they could be their best selves, that they could, and, and, and I didn't have time to pick favorites. I didn't have time to, to figure out who I liked and who I didn't like. We were all going to serve our nation and, and I wanted to create an environment where we could all flourish, where we could all be our best selves. And that's what our challenge is as leaders, is to create that environment where we can truly, truly live up to our best selves. Well, it's been nearly 17 years, 17 years next month, a fateful day in May, of May 7th of 2007, I can remember that day like yesterday because I was returning first from a memorial service for two young men. First Lieutenant Ryan Jones and Special Somando Sunson were two men that were part of the brigade that I was part of from Fort Riley, Kansas, who would paid in full measure just three days before. I had the honor of attending a short memorial service. Well, I remember that day because I was struggling with their sacrifice, trying to sort out whether or not we were making a difference halfway around the world in a very violent and unstable environment in Baghdad, Iraq. Every single day it felt like a U.S. service member, someone with a, an American flag on their right shoulder was paying with their lives. And I was wondering if we were making a difference and my organization was a difference. And was is this worth it? So after the memorial service and a four vehicle patrol, I would head back to my headquarters, leaving Ford Operating Base Falcon heading back to Liberty. Shortly after leaving Falcon, my vehicle was, was struck by a command-detonated improvised explosive device. It wasn't random. I was targeted. The blast lifted my 15,000-pound armored vehicle off the road and ejected me out of the vehicle, where I can remember flying through the air and hitting the ground and coming to a rolling stop on my back. I knew exactly what it was. It was actually the second time that I'd been in a vehicle that had been hit by a roadside bomb, but this time was very different. My anger and outrage very quickly shifted to realizing that I was gravely wounded and I could not get up. And the last thing that I would say was, God, I do not want to die in this country, and I lost consciousness. Amen. But my teammates, Men like First Sergeant Frederick Johnson, the senior non-commissioned officer in my patrol, who would be the first to arrive at my vehicle and was the one that recognized that I was missing, and he would locate me about a football field from where my vehicle stopped. I was already unconscious, lying in a pool of my blood where he began to resuscitate me. And a young private named Eric Brown would put the tourniquets on my legs, a fact that the doctors say saved my life. Now what is special about this young man was that he was not a medic. He wasn't a school trained medic in my, in my organization. He was actually the NBC specialist or nuclear, biological, and chemical specialist. We call it nobody cares, right? <laughs> but as fate would have it, the medic that was assigned in my personal security attachment, he slipped on some ice and broke his ankle and he couldn't deploy with us immediately. So we did what any organization would do, we asked for a replacement medic and, and naturally they didn't have one. My headquarters first sergeant would recommend and send Private Brown to a two week 
I say again, a two-week emergency medical training course at Kansas State University, right outside of Fort Riley, Kansas. He would finish this course just days before we were going to deploy. And they came to me with the recommendation of putting him in one of my subordinate platoons and bringing up a medic for myself, bringing up a school trained medic or an MOS medic for myself. But I said no. First on the basis of not really wanting to upset all the teamwork that we had focused on and getting ready for this deployment. But more personally for me, that I felt if this young man was good enough for my soldiers, then he was good enough for me. And so I kept him as my medic. Never could I have imagined that I would be wounded. But that night, just to give you a perspective of first my injuries, but more significantly the environment that we were operating in. In those first four to six hours after I was wounded, I would go through 129 pints of blood and die six times that evening. But more significantly, I will tell you that 131 U.S. service members would pay with their lives in the month of May of 2007 alone, and more than 10 times that number were significantly wounded like myself. And so I he I'm here to tell you that I'm here today because my team, my team saved my life. I would arrive here in Washington, D.C. at Walter Reed Army Medical Center on the 11th of May, just four days after being wounded, intubated on a feeding tube in an induced coma, going through surgery every other day to repair my blood vessels and clean up my wounds. Just a week back, on the 18th of May, while I was in the intensive care, uh, the blood vessels in my left leg could no longer sustain blood flow and it started to bleed to death. An ICU nurse would put, take off her belt and put a fuel expedient tourniquet on my leg and they took me in the surgery and had to amputate my left leg above the knee to save my life. The next day, guess what? The same thing happened to my right leg, but this time the doctors were one step ahead. And they actually would pull a vein from my left bicep and they put it in my right leg so they were able to save my right leg. Well, by this time, I was uh, out of my induced coma and able to communicate with the doctors. Um, I was obviously on a lot of drugs, if you can imagine, legal ones for if you're here in D.C. So, <laughs> um, but able to communicate with the doctors. And ultimately, I would make the decision for the doctors to amputate my right leg. I was frankly tired of surgery, but more significantly, I just wanted to get on with my life and I figured my quality of life would be better as you see me now or, or in two prosthetics. And so on the 24th of May, the doctors in fact amputated my right leg above the knee. Well, when I came out of that surgery, um, I got some more great news. They had decided to re-x-ray my right arm because I had been complaining about it. And so when I came out of that surgery, I found out that not only was the radial head of my elbow broken, but uh, the, the, uh, my upper bicep was, uh, 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 my upper bicep and my right arm was broken. And, uh, and that would require some, uh, some surgery to repair it. And, and about a week later, I in fact had that surgery on my, on my right arm. Um, unfortunately, I had some complications from that surgery. Um, uh, I, I not only sustained a, a radial nerve damage, which at the time prevented me from picking up the right wrist or bending my right wrist or my right hand, but the uh, ulnar nerve damage, which to this day prevents the full use of uh, my fingers on my right hand. So at this point, about uh, three months after being wounded, I'm, uh, or not three months, uh, just a uh, you know, six weeks after being wounded, I'm, uh, I'm down to one limb. My non-dominant left arm and hand was all that I could use. I was about 215 pounds before I was wounded. I was now down to about 145 pounds. Again, needing assistance or help with literally every aspect of my daily life. And I will tell you, it was probably the straw that broke the camel's back when I lost the use of um, my, and the function of my right arm and hand. I absolutely did not want to be a burden 
want anyone. I didn't want to be a burden on my family or anyone else. And I would tell you, as I would say, is that that's when I tried to quit. I tried to give up. It was more than I believed that I could take. But I had never quit in my life. My life has been a fight from the, from the very beginning. And as bad and as bleak as it looked, um, I couldn't quit now. And that's when I decided that I was just going to live my life. My legs were gone, so there was no need in me looking back at yesterday. And I actually had no vision of a future. I had no vision, and I had no idea where, where my life was going to go. All I knew was that I could only live the day I was in. All I knew was I could only be the best that I could be every day. And I rededicated my life to just that simple cause of living my best life every day. If anyone knew that tomorrow wasn't promised, I certainly appreciated that, that every single one of us in here one day will not have a tomorrow. So why not, why worry about that? Let me just live my best life today. And so I began as, they, as we started talking about my future and they were talking about medically retiring me and putting me off the pasture, I said no. I mean, I was a lieutenant colonel and I'm like, you know, you guys are not really paying me for how fast I can run. <laughs> You're paying me for what's up here and what's in, what's in here. And I started to push back and inquire about my being able to continue to serve. And along the way, I had so many people that from all walks of my life, from the, from the, from the past, uh, from high school, from college, and, and throughout my Army career that were there to cushion my blow, the shock of this uh, devastating injuries to myself and to my family. And one such individual named Mike Sullivan, a classmate and teammate who happened to be a coach for the New York football giants who come to visit me in the hospital uh, when I was still an inpatient uh, that summer. Well, he said, you know, he, he reminded me that he would be back in town when, uh, when the Giants would come to play the then Washington Redskins, and he asked me if I wanted to attend the game. I said, sure. So true to his word, the third week of the season, the Giants had started out 0-2, been played horrible football, um, and come into town to play the undefeated Washington Redskins. Well, Mike called me up and asked me if I wanted to come to the game, and I said, sure. He asked me how many tickets I needed, and I let him know what I needed for to cover the rest of my family, and he said, sure, no problem. Well, he called me back on a, on a Tuesday the next day to ask me uh, if I would be willing to speak to the New York Giants. You know, they were not performing very well, and and I remember thinking, ah, oh, you set me up. You offered me tickets, and now he wants me to, <laughs> he wants me to talk to the team. Well, realize this, I'd never spoken publicly uh, to any organization outside the Army, but my teammate asked me to do something. I said, sure. Well, that Saturday after uh, my kids' Pop Warner football game, my wife is driving me from Fort Belvoir to downtown D.C. to meet the, uh, the link, meet up with the Giants. And, and I've got a blank three by five card in my hand and she's stressing me out, asking me what I'm gonna talk about and I have no idea. And I shared a little bit of what I'm sharing with you all this, uh, this morning um, in a much more brief manner, probably a 15 or, or 20 minute speech, but it was my, the first one I had ever, uh, had ever done. And, and I didn't even know it was a drop the mic moment because, uh, because Coach Coughlin, um, dismissed the team after I spoke. He, all the other meetings they had on the schedule, um, they, uh, they, they, they dismissed for the evening. And, 
And I literally would go into the, the team, uh, you know, cat, the team dining room and I, I got some dinner and Plexico Burr sat down next to me and we were from the same hometown and we chatted for a little bit and then I went home. Well, the next day, I, my, uh, we, I drive back to the stadium with, uh, to FedEx Field with my family and they decided to put me on the sidelines uh, instead of having me um, um, in the stands. And one of my, my children took a half a piece to, to be down there to help me move it around. And I remember it was, um, I remember going to the locker room at halftime. It was the Washington Redskins 14 and New York Giants 3. And I'm thinking, boy, that, there's my motivational speaking career already <laughs> off to a great start. Uh, but the Giants would ultimately rally, uh, winning the game 24 to 17. I know that's not a popular story in these parts, but uh, I, you know, anyway, it, uh, the Giants would end up winning the game, and it would be the first of 11 consecutive road victories, which is still a, a record today, 11 consecutive road victories. Um, in which the, the Giants uh, beat the undefeated New England Patriots in, uh, in Super Bowl 42, where I got a chance to talk with the Giants uh, one more time the night before that game. And what I shared with them, what I shared with them is that if I could be anywhere in the world right now, I would be back with my soldiers, but I would take every single one of them with, with me because I, um, had watched them become um, a team. And so um, I'm not only the owner of one uh, Super Bowl ring, but we just to, just to make sure it wasn't a fluke, we went back and we beat the Patriots again in Super Bowl 46. So I'm 2-0 and against the GOAT, so. <laughs> Thank you. But more significantly um, was, uh, I mean, what I'm most proud of was that I was able to serve for an additional, almost an additional eight years uh, post-injury. Um, what I say to, what I say to those that are in a, dis, in a disabled community is that, um, that, is that every day um, I get up, I go to work, I'm involved in whatever I did for eight years after being wounded, I got up and I put my uniform on. And so how am I disabled? if I'm doing everything that everybody else does with less. And so as we look at those that are different from us, as we look at those uh, that have challenges, you know, guess what? We all have challenges. And we all stand to learn from each other when we embrace those challenges. That's part of being our best. That's part of, of of living up to our best. I understood for my life to continue, I was going to have to live up to being my best. I didn't know what it looked like, I didn't know what it felt like, but you know what? None of us truly do know what life has in store for us. I can guarantee you that, that most of us will encounter challenges in our lives. And every day we have a chance to build on that DNA that we will draw on when we're faced with those kind of challenges. And we build that DNA, we build that character by living up to our best selves. Every single one of us in here knows when we fall short to living up to our best selves. All we gotta do is just look in the mirror did we have an opportunity to be our best selves? Did I, was I short? Was I, was I, did I cut somebody off? Did I not want to listen? Did I not want to open my heart? Did I not want to open my humanity? We're all guilty of it. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. But hopefully, hopefully there's more days Hopefully there's a lot more days um, built into, uh, uh, that, that I live up to my best self. That I live up to my best self. You know, part of the great, the greatest part of the American dream is, is to have some place to live, to have a home. 
And you, more than anyone in our government, represent that opportunity for us to achieve the American dream. 17 years ago, as I thought about my future life, the number one concern that I had was access. Where was I going to live? How was I going to live? Was I going to live, was I going to be able to find a home that was going to allow me to live my dream. That was my number one question that I needed to answer was my access. Physical, driving, all these kind of things that have to do with access. In America, we often, we often think of our personal freedoms in the abstract. Freedom of speech, freedom to, to talk and do the things that we want to do. Rarely do we, we, we take for granted our freedom of movement. Having to think about what kind of obstacles that I'm going to have to encounter when I go to dinner, when I go to the movies, whatever. Is there going to be someone that can meet me on the other side that can, can help me with my wheelchair? Most of us, I did for all of my life, take it for granted. And now it's become part of my life. It's become part of my family's life. It's become part of the lives of my friends. And anybody that has anything to do with me understands that I've got to have, that we've got to address access. And that's what today is about. That's what this month's about. That's what this is about, living up to our best self. It's not taking for granted access and recognizing that we all have room for improvement and being considerate and extending dignity and respect to everyone, regardless, regardless of their challenges. So I come back full circle to in, in order to form a more perfect union. Lori said this isn't about checking the block. It can be. It's more, than just, it's more than just following the regulations. Regulations regulate our behavior. But to me, the opportunity here is about changing hearts. When we live with a spirit of access, then we will always do the right thing. Not because we have to, but because we want to. And that's where I believe that we have to go. That's where our best angels are. That's where we are. We have the opportunity to, to fulfill our best lives as Americans is when we do those things not because we have to, but because we want to, because they, because they emanate uh, from our heart. And so with that, I will, uh, I will close my comments and open the floor to questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, Steve Schneider, First Sergeant, U.S. Army, retired. What, when were you at Fort Belvoir, sir? 
Yes, so uh, thanks first, Sergeant, um, and thank you for your service. Um, I served at Fort Belvoir from uh, June of 20, as the garrison commander, uh, June of 2012 to June of 2014. Okay. I, I was at Fort Belvoir from 2002 to 2003 as a, as a young sergeant going through Prime Power School, and I remember you speaking at one of our ceremonies for one of many other ceremonies, but I remember you were, you spoke. In 2000? I was there from 2000, but then I was again, I was there again from, yeah, from 2011, so then maybe it was, a, I was at yeah. Fort Belvoir twice. Right, yeah, so I was at the Prime, Prime Power, Power yeah, Battalion. so I, I actually lived on Fort Belvoir, so uh, when I was um, recovering, I, um, in August of 2007 to August 2011, okay. I, li so I, that, I lived. So that was after your injury. Right. And I can honestly say, sir, your presence and your story now are just as powerful and as strong as they were then for me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Colonel Gatson, I have a question online for you. It's a lengthy one, so it says, Colonel, first of all, I wanted to say that it's an honor to learn that I served in Desert Shield, Desert Storm as an Army combat medic with another brother in arms, such as yourself. You're a true inspiration. My question to you revolves around the first of many times I've watched the movie Battleship over the last 10 years. <laughs> In quotes, he says, I'm a sci-fi geek, but I saw several positive messages to vets. If you just read between the lines, I love the character you played and the inspirational message I personally felt like it sent to all veterans who have served and struggled even today with the aftermath of the trauma from being in a combat environment. But I have always wondered during the fight scene um, where you put the beat down on the alien, if you ever felt symbolic of any low points you may have had or experienced shortly after your accident, and if so, how did you apply the same beat down to power through as you did with that alien and find yourself again after such trauma? As a disabled veteran myself, you truly inspire me by all you have overcome. Thank you, sir, for all you sacrificed. Go Army! Go Army. <laughs> well, that's a mouthful. Um, yeah. I'll see if I can uh, tackle that question. Um, so one of the things that... Uh, so. I never acted before in my life. That's my first time uh, ever acting. And, and, and I will say this, I was kind of, I, I, I assumed this sort of uh, attitude of uh, Mikey. If anybody remember Mikey, like if Mikey likes it, you know, and, I, and that was me. I was like Mike, you know, um, Peter Berg, who was a New York Giants fan, so that's why he called me up. He, uh, he, uh, he says, hey, I want you to be in my movie. And I was like, sure, why not? And then, you know, I just kind of answered it like that. And they kept trying to get me out of, uh, they kept trying to get me out to L.A. to do a screen test. And, and, um, and I wouldn't go. I was like, I, I, I just been approved to stay on active duty. I'm like, I, I'm not going to mess with that. And, and um, so Pete, <laughs> Peter flew out to D.C. And I, I, of all places, I actually did my screen test for, for Battleship in Dan Snyder's office, the owner of Washington Redskins. <laughs> that guy's a real jerk, but anyway. I, you know, so anyway, um, I probably shouldn't have said that. But anyway, um, so uh, I got permission, I eventually got permission from the, uh, from the, from the Army to, to do the movie. And, and so um, a lot of people feel like that I was sort of just playing myself. And, and, um, and I, I say absolutely not. Um, I certainly could empathize uh, with the character, but I think the thing that uh, I felt like I was able to really bring to that character was all of the soldiers that were in Walter Reed that, w that were healing with me, and not to say I knew every single one of them, because I did, but you know, I'm, I'm an observant person, and you just, I mean, you, I watch people I watched relationships get created. I watched relationships dissolve. I mean, I saw a full spectrum, the full emotional spectrum of, of recovery and all the complex things that were happening with, 
with so many people around me on a daily basis. And, and so as I started to work through that character, I felt like I, was, I, I, had, I had points where I could draw on from things I observed and, and could bring that uh, to, to my character. Um, I, I say I made the, I made the mistake or, or, or actually request of wanting to do my own, wanting to do my stunts. And, um, and that fight scene literally took like four days and I was regretting it after like day one because <laughs> they were just long days. I thought it would be cool, but it was just, it was, I lost my voice every day. It was, it was a lot of work. And so um, I'm proud of it, but it, was, um, it wasn't as easy as, a, as I thought it was gonna be. Um, but, you know, um, Again, our lives are, are, are really in so many ways about living up to our best self. I mean, um, we often, uh, Kevin said, we make this decision every day. And I, I, Kevin, I, I really, we make a decision. We can take the, the easy road or the hard road. And, and to get the most out of this, this life is it's about taking the challenges. It's about growing. Um, and, you know, intuitively I'd say that I, I, I understood that, but it is a decision. It is a decision that we all get to make every day. Am I gonna, am I gonna live up to my best self, my best angels, or am I looking for a path that, 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 that's, the, that's the easy way? Raise your hand if you've ever had a bad day. Okay, all right, all right. And who said it was a bad day? <laughs> you. And that's a decision. That's a decision. Um, I'm not saying that bad things don't happen. I mean, you know, honestly, sometimes people come to me and, you know, they're impressed with my story and, they, and they'll say, everything happens for a reason, like, like this happened to me for a reason. I'm like, yeah, the SOB was trying to kill me. <laughs> okay. But we have within all of us the resolve to overcome those kind of things. And that's a decision. I say in the, in the most simplest terms, we're a victim or we're a conqueror. And you get to own that. I'm not here to cast any judgment on anyone. But you decide. And, um, and we only have one life to live. And, uh, and I, I have, my growth has always been out of my struggle, the things that I didn't anticipate, the things that I didn't know about, the things that, that hurt sometimes. But struggle is not a bad word. I like to say that's just, that just means you're living. And, um, and so, you know what? We put that shade on our lives. We put that light on our life. And, and every day you get to own that. And, uh, and I, I, I just say as we try to live our best lives in ourselves, we become lights to those around us. We give off that energy of light and energy and optimism or the converse of that, too. So I do have some more questions um, for you, and I just want to Someone is in the audience? OK, please, go ahead. Hoorah, Colonel. Hoorah. Hoorah. Devil dog. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, hoorah. Um, I, uh, well, just, just for everybody, it's, it's a battle cry for warriors. Army got their own. We always respect each other. Now, we might talk smack every now and then, Right, but the respect is there. Um, uh, thank you for your service from one veteran to another. And um, I also want to make a quick comment. And, and you know this, uh, Colonel, being a person in your situation. Uh, we don't do everything right in this country, but one of the greatest things that we are so innovative and, and, and just at the forefront of it is accessibility. No other country that, that I've been to can do it better than we do in this country. And that's something to be grateful for. 
Um, in saying that, um, I wanted to ask if, if you're working on any collaborative efforts between the VA and HUD as far as access into the housing, right? Uh, the Architectural Barriers Act uh, is what we work here uh, at HUD in trying to you know, first get access into the home and then throughout the home to all the different amenities um, for persons that are uh, accessibly, accessibly challenged. Um, if there's any collaborative efforts on that end, um, and if, if so, you know, do you guys keep count of how many uh, veterans, not all veterans have access to grants, you know, to rehabilitate their single family homes, so obviously most of them live in rental units. If you guys do keep uh, track of any of those numbers. Thanks, sir. So, uh, thanks for your question. Um, I am um, not officially, or I mean, I'm, I'm a VA um, uh, um, recipient, but I'm not uh, officially part of it, anything that they do officially. Um, your question actually begs, uh, it sounds, it's a great question, and I, I would wonder if, um, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, experience and accessibility that, um, um, uh, that you all have that could, could, uh, could benefit the VA. The VA has uh, uh, the two grants, or three grants that I'm um, aware of that, that has to do with accessibility. Uh, what's interesting though is that the, the VA doesn't provide any of the expertise in terms of recommendation. They, uh, they authorize the funds uh, once they kind of verify it's for a valid purpose, but, but in terms of coaching and, and uh, you know, what's out there, I, I think there's, there's great room for that and that maybe that would be a, a, a great collaboration to, to, to look at if, if, if uh, uh, from, from that perspective. Um, I, I accessed a couple of the grants. Uh, one, one is, a, I think, a SAH or SHA grant and a, and a HISA grant through the, uh, through the Veterans Health Administration. And, um, um, but I relied on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, an architect or, um, that talked about different options. One of the, one of the, the things that I was sort of blessed with in, in speaking and traveling a bunch is that I got to see a lot of different combinations of, of accessibility things. So I, I was inadvertently educated on, on different accessible options. And so when it was time for me to, um, when it was time for me to build a home, um, I, could, I could intelligently communicate um, what was, uh, was going to work. But um, I'm sure there's, a, there's many that don't have that, um, that don't have that experience and don't have that, that wherewithal and they just sort of rely on, on, on experts. I mean, I could tell you, I, I would tell you that seven out of 10 accessible showers that I experience in hotel rooms, they're messed up. I mean, like, okay, it's like, you know, how am I supposed to reach the controls when I'm sitting on the bench? I mean, this little, little things like that are just, um, we, we take for granted, because guess what? The person that put that shower together didn't, wasn't legless like me, and you know, and so it all makes sense if you got legs. So um, there's, there's a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of I, collaboration, I think, growth and opportunity um, uh, with a with a with a sister department that you know might be worth exploring. Hope I, I hope I answer your question. Yeah. Well, Colonel Gatson, I just wanted to let you know that our peak um, attendance online was close to a thousand. So I just wanted you to know how many people were wow. were listening in as well. And, and I have about five questions here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an administrative decision to narrow it down to one. Some of what you've said has answered some of their questions. Yep. The last question um, that I'd like to ask, and then we have to uh, do a Q&A for a giveaway of your book. Oh, did I give that away? Uh, <laughs> I like what you said about being a victim or a conqueror. What advice would you give to someone who's trying hard to manage their disability but doesn't feel like they're receiving the support they need? Um, 
So, um, you know, I, uh, I guess fortunately you could say um, I didn't have the, I didn't have the, uh, the luxury of hiding my disability. And so it's in your face, you know, I'm, whether I'm in my prosthetics, if I'm in my prosthetics, I wear short pants because long pants are hard to deal with. So I wear shorts and so you're gonna see it. Um, and so um, with that being said, um, the questions often come to me without me having to, uh, you know, sh share it. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of folks have disabilities that are not as obvious. And, and so um, um, what I would say is it's incumbent upon us not to hide, but to communicate. And not, um, not for someone to feel sorry for me, what, but, but to say, hey, these are my needs. These are my challenges. You know, um, in my last two jobs in, in the Army, uh, director of the Army Wounded Warrior Program and garrison commander of uh, Fort Belvoir. When I got to work, I called somebody and they came down and helped me with my wheelchair. It was, it was, that, that was my accommodation. And, and you know, I, I would just say, um, you don't have to let your pride ever get in your way. This was probably the most humbling thing that could have happened to me in my life. I mean, I was, I was, you know, picture perfect, an army athlete. There wasn't anything I couldn't do in my life. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't do anything. And when you got to ask for help, when you ask for help, that's a sign of strength. It's not a weakness. It's actually a sign of strength to ask for help. And I go around the country, around the world, and I don't have any problem. Like, I'll, you know, I go and run the errands. I get to, I get to help out, and, and I'll go to the store by myself, and, I, and guess what my plan is? I'm going to pull in a parking space, and someone will eventually come by and grab my wheelchair out of the back of my pickup truck. What's wrong with that? Um, and if I really know I'm going to be somewhere where someone's not there, I, then I stick it in my back seat. But I got a plan. I mean, it's, it's okay to think about those kinds of things. Um, every single one of us in here has a story. And so what, and, and part of living up to our best selves is, is how many stories of those do you know, do you really know of those around you? And I challenge us, I challenge us to know what everybody's story is. Because as leaders, as people that, as coworkers, when you know the story of those around you, you can better support them, you can better help them, you can better empathize with them, you can, be, you can better lead them if you know what their story is. And I, and I guarantee you, every, you'll, you'll be shocked You'll be shocked. You know, Lori shared with her, I mean, the fact that her mother was dealing with, with, a, with a auto, a cerebral palsy, is it? Multiple sclerosis, Multiple sclerosis MS. And, um, and, and so she has a perspective that not many people would intuitively figure out. She would, she would, she would, and she would respond to me in a completely different way, but I would know very quickly after being around her that she has a touch with those that have some challenges within minutes. Well, that's being our best. That's growing and that's challenging ourselves. We have one question here, ma'am, for you. Fitz. Actually, sir, you kind of addressed it. Uh, my question was going to um, deal with the hidden disabilities. Uh, in my case, a traumatic brain injury. Yep. But um, thank you for your service. Thank you for talking to us. And thank you for talking to the New York Giants. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> I agree. And thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you, sir.
Well, that's all we're going to take right now. Colonel Gadsden, thank you so much for answering the questions. Will you have a few minutes afterwards? If Sure. sure. Okay, yeah. great. Well, we're going to ask some questions, Rodney. I'm going to bring Rodney Cox to the stage. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Rodney Cox. Um, average height, so my brothers tell me I'm not. I'm bald head, <laughs> a beard. Currently, I'm wearing a brown gray suit, blue shirt, blue, brown, and dark brown striped tie. Um, today, um, I will be giving you the overall rules for the um, Q&A questions. The goal is to be, since I'm from the Office of Department of EEO, um, to be equal opportunity to everyone who's here today and for those in the virtual world, we're going to ask eight questions. Four questions for the individuals sitting here before us and four questions for the individuals in the virtual world. So hello. And uh, when you answer the questions correctly in the virtual world, um, please provide, wait till the end of the questions and provide your name, give it the correct answers, and if you're the correct person, we'll send you a copy autographed copy, that is, of this book to you uh, with 16 years worth of the Colonel's thoughts, conversations, trials, tribulations, and challenges that he memorialized in this book. So when you give the correct answers, I will provide you a copy of this book. With me today, helping to present the questions I have. Rochelle Wilson, Disability Program Manager in the Office of Affirmative Employment Division. Hello, I'm Brittany Birdsong, the team lead for the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility. And we changed it to IDEA, so inclusion first. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we will get started. I will pass off the books to the correct responses in the audience. And again, we will mail the correct responses to the people on virtual world. Just for, wait till the end of all the questions. And if you correctly answer the questions, send an email to the um, information on the end. So we'll start Okay, so I will be asking the questions in person and Brittany will be handling the virtual questions. So the first question that I have is what is the definition of accessibility? Good answer. Thank you. Removing, oh, removing barriers that prevent people from accessing the space. It's about the space, not the person. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me read the answer um, to the question. Okay, so the definition that we have is accessibility means a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability. All right, so question number two. Oh. No, wait! <laughs> Okay, so question number two for the people in uh, virtual land is which NFL team did uh, Colonel Gaskin credited with motivating to win Super Bowl 42? Oh, this is virtual. This is the virtual, <laughs> virtual folks. Oh. We might have to get the. So the voice you have two seconds. Let someone off the virtual world. No one. Okay. Well, the answer was the Giants, as we've already <laughs> established. Okay, so this is the in person question. Do not yell out the answer, come up to the mic, okay? What does the acronym ADA stand for? Americans with Disability Act. That is correct. <laughs> All right, so in virtual land, our question is, what is an example of a physical barrier to accessibility? And this is for our virtual audience.
Okay, we're going to repeat that question, and it's what is an example of physical barriers to accountability accessibility? So we have to have people with physical ones. All right. Okay, you have an answer. We have an answer online. Okay. Thank you. We have an ex we have an answer online. All right. So that was a virtual an question, right? Yeah. The an the first question we got was a curb. A curb could be a physical barrier to accessibility. Okay, a curb could be an example of a physical barrier. Okay, so yes, and just so we are clear, uh, sidewalks and door um, sidewalks and doorways that are too narrow for a wheelchair scooter or walker. Uh, as we said, a desk that is too high for a person that um, is in a with mo a wheelchair or a mobility device, and poor lighting that makes it difficult for a person with a low vision or a person who read lip lip reads. <laughs> All, right. All right. So the next question, please come to the mic. Um, what what does ARC stand for? <laughs> Accessibility Review Committee. Good job. And this is our last question for our virtual audience. And the question is, what movie did Colonel Gaskin uh, appear in? Oh, I skipped one. This is my question too, okay. <laughs> so I apologize, virtual land. Um, the question is, what does the acronym IDEA or IDEA stand for? Oh yeah, there is a delay. Okay, and one more time is, what does the acronym IDEA stand for? Absolutely, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. All right, so this is the last in-person question. What military academy? <laughs> oh yes, that is <laughs> incorrect. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Still, okay, so I'm still going to read the question just so everyone can hear. It. <laughs> What military academy did Colonel Gadsden graduate from? Graduate from, and the answer is West Point. Okay. Okay. Now the question: What movie did Colonel Gadsden make his acting debut in in 2012? Virtual only. Only yes. And again, the question is, what movie did Colonel Gasson uh, debut in in the year 2012? Got it. All Battleship. right. Battleship, that's it. All right. Okay, so now we will have Miss oh, Patrice Debache. So that was a little unruly. <laughs> you guys are out of control, but I'm glad you're having fun and learning at the same time. I'm just here to make a few announcements. Um, I want you all to save the date of April 16th because the, um, the um, accessibility hybrid meetings and telework is going to be presented to, at HUD. And you're going to learn the success, strategies, tips, and tools that you can use in this 60-minute workshop designed to help strengthen the way you work together in any environment and location. The training will help you, um, your teams, understand how to run more effective, engaging, and exclusive hybrid meetings. And also, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you all about the Office of EEO's Essential Conversations coming up on Wednesday, May 8th. 
And I know you've always wanted to know what's the difference between anti-harassment and EEO, right? Well, this is your opportunity because we will be having a session on that as well for an hour, May 8th, 1 p.m. And I'm going to let my director, Mr. Wayne Williams, close us out. Good afternoon, everybody. No, that's not how we do it here. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, if I have the energy, you should have the energy, right? So first and foremost, I want to thank our special guest. So please give him a round of applause. And we're not going to let him go. The reason I had him sit up here is because we got to indoctrinate him into the HUD family. So sir, what you may not be aware of is that uh, and through the tradition of the military, you know, they like to give out challenge coins and commander coins. But we have what we call an EELDIA coin of excellence. And I can't think of a better recipient, a more worthy recipient, than you coming here today and helping us understand accessibility from the viewpoint of leadership and from the viewpoint of individuals. Uh, so we want to give you the coin. The coin has a number on it. I'm coming to you. <laughs> wow, beautiful coin, too. Uh, and we're, we're kind of selfish because what we do is put you on the level, and this way you're always part of the hood. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. A tremendous presentation, and thank you. I also want to thank our other speakers. I want to thank Lori, as always, of Chico. You went up there and served it up great. Um, Mr. Kevin McNeely, um, our Office of Administration. Uh, again, thank you for your comments. I want to thank our media group. Um, they always do a superior job. Uh, I want to thank Gerald. And uh, when I thank Gerald, Gerald, stand up for a minute if you would. I, I want to point out connections, because connections are important. Interactions are important. Uh, I had an interaction with this gentleman at Fort Belvoir. For those who don't know, I'm a Reti I'm retired, uh, first sergeant myself, uh, but I did 23 years in the Army, and I was at Fort Belvoir, and we ran into each other. I said, it would be a great idea if you would come to HUD and provide you know, some, some remarks for us and inspire the, the folks here on accessibility. Without hesitation, he said yes. I and mean, as we talked further, uh, I said, well, great. I know a guy, you know, he's our VAG president, and he'll reach out to you. And I said, Gerald Bennett. He said, Gerald? I said, yeah, Gerald, but Gerald. <laughs> Gerald was the first black quarterback at West Point, so please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Connections mean everything. Um, that connection, disconnection, led to disconnection. So we're thankful for you, Gerald, and for VAG, and for all that you do. Um, I want to make sure I don't miss anybody, but if I do, it's only because my memory is not as great as it was. Uh, it's not because I'm overlooking you or your contributions. So I want to thank all of you for participating virtually as well as those in the audience. And of course, I have to have my opportunity to give some remarks. So when you look at my remarks, I kind of feel a little bit, it's like three little remarks, but I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to flip it over because I want to talk to you from the heart for a minute. And when I thought about accessibility, I struggled with that definition. Me, the EEO director, Wayne Williams, I struggled with that definition. I struggled with it. I couldn't figure it out. It's like, okay, we talk about accessibility, but we always talk about it from the standpoint of facilities or personal accommodations. But what does it really mean? And the word that came to mind for me was empowerment. When you think about accessibility, it's really about empowering. How do we empower people? How do we empower ourselves? You know? We go through changes in life. We go through many changes in life. How many of you still wear the same clothes you were wearing 10 years ago? That's just a pride moment. It's like, yeah, I can still fit this. I can do it. I know I can, right? <laughs> But I guarantee you, if bell bottoms were in style 10 years ago, you didn't show up in them today, right? Because we're going through changes. We're constantly going through changes. And there's no one size, no one suit that fits all. 
And we have to be aware of that so that we're inclusive. Because through inclusiveness is how we empower people. It's how we empower ourselves. And when we empower people, there are three things that occur. We teach them that to say these three things, I can, I will, and I am. I can share, I can teach, I can learn, I will contribute, I will be present, I will bring my full self. I am competent, I am confident, but most importantly, and I want you to remember this if you don't remember anything else, I am worthy. I'm worthy, I'm worthy of the effort. So I'm gonna challenge the audience now. I'm gonna challenge all of you and I'm gonna challenge you virtually and in person. And if you don't listen to me, I got a warrior here who beat up aliens. So he'll certainly <laughs> take it to you. I want you to repeat this. I will do better when it comes to accessibility. I will do better. Can you say that? Oh no, you gotta convince me. Did that convince you, sir? Don't give him a break. That, that was kind of like, yeah. Would the Giants have won the Super Bowl if they, you went out there like that? Yeah, I will. So let's try it again. I will do better. I will do better. I can do better. I can do better. And here's the big one. I am committed to doing better. I am committed to doing better. This is how we're going to empower people. This is how we're going to empower each other. This is how we're going to empower the organization. And this is how we're going to implement that change to the consistency of empowerment. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Again, thank you. Um, I don't want to forget our FEMA folks. And I know I forgot, I always forget, so let me describe myself. I am 5'11", I'm wearing a gray suit. I am multiracial, but I identify as African-American. I had hair <laughs> a long time ago. I don't anymore. Um, and with that, I want to also invite you to um, join us for refreshments in the adjacent room for those who are here in person. For those who are there virtually, uh, have a virtual snack on me. I appreciate you. <laughs> you guys have been wonderful, and thank you all.